11th Globus World, 10th or 11th, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, been, it's been a while, but thank you for coming out. I'm Vas Vasiliadis with the Globus team. I'm at the Computation Institute. And um, we've got a pretty jam-packed agenda here today and a lot of exciting speakers. So I'm not gonna spend uh, too much time setting things up. Um, I hope everybody got here okay and has arrangements uh, squared away. We will have a dinner event this evening. You'll hear more about that later. But I wanna get us uh, kicked off here with our keynote speaker, Ian Foster, uh, co-founder of the Globus Project originally. And uh, he's gonna take us through the journey uh, which started about 15 years ago. And uh, we've got some exciting things uh, going on today. Ian. Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to GW 2013. Uh, Vass just told me that isn't our Twitter hashtag because that's Greek Week 2013. So we're uh, Globus 2013 if you are following uh, or tweeting. Um, so I, I'm glad that so many of you made it through the sequester to get here. Uh, I know some uh, national labs and NASA people uh, are stuck at home, but uh, we have a good crowd, so that's, that's good. So I, I'm going to uh, basically we used to grandose, grandiosely call this the State of the Union, which is a bit a silly thing to say, but basically I'm going to uh, review uh, what we've been doing over the last year and say a few words about some of our plans for the future, and, and then I'll introduce what's going on in the rest of the conference. So as this title says, uh, we've been on a journey, okay, so but we've been working for quite a few years now. Uh, I'd say... Uh, in some sense, we're doing quite different things over the years, but uh, really working towards, a, uh, towards a, a consistent goal, which is providing sustainable uh, research infrastructure uh, for large numbers of researchers. And uh, you know, we started way back in 1998. Uh, we're only about this tall back then. Uh, building out the Globus Toolkit. Uh, the goal back then was to uh, uh, provide um, open source software that people could use to build distributed resource uh, integration and access systems. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Services like GRAM and GridFTP and other uh, relevant components that people could deploy on their resources to make them uh, accessible over the network for purposes of computation or data movement, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and, well, we've had some success with that, as I'll point out. Uh, starting about three years ago, uh, we launched uh, a new effort uh, called Globus Online, which is really uh, seeks to leverage modern advances uh, in uh, areas such as software as a service uh, to make uh, powerful, in particular, data management capabilities available to many more uh, people. Uh, and then most recently, just uh, I guess last week, we uh, launched a, another service which builds on top of the uh, earlier ones called uh, Globus Genomics, which is uh, providing sequencing services uh, for uh, too many people. And in fact, Ravi Majuri, one of the leaders of that, just walked in. Hey, Ravi. So, hi. So, <laughs> got you there. Okay. Um, so, but uh, I'd say there's a, there's a consistent goal underpinning this, which is this one of uh, seeking to accelerate discovery by, uh, well, I, I like to think of it, you know, we, we sometimes are de de described as plumbers. We're trying to uh, uh, build uh, software and services, software initially, increasingly services, that automate activities that uh, get in the way of discovery and innovation in research labs uh, that no one really wants to be an expert in, that uh, uh, people find uh, expensive and time-consuming uh, and painful to uh, do themselves, and that can be done more effectively uh, via automated uh, mechanisms. And uh, we believe that by providing the right services, we can both accelerate uh, discovery and reduce costs, uh, which are often two sides of the same uh, coin. And uh, you know, most recently, we, we've, seek to do, we've sought to do these things by delivering uh, robust research data management uh, as a service. But let me say a few words about where we uh, started and, and where those uh, components are going. So. Uh, the Globus Toolkit, um, some of you are familiar with, um, you know, it uh, has uh, encompassed over the years a variety of components, uh, GridFTP um, and GRAM, GridFTP for remote 
access to storage systems and uh, movement of data between storage systems, uh, GRAM uh, for remote access to uh, computer systems and job submission and management on storage systems, MyProxy and GSI OpenSSH from our partners at NCSA, uh, which is um, you're concerned with credential management in the first case and, and, uh, and translation and, uh, and uh, secure access to remote uh, uh, computing systems. Uh, these are all things that uh, have uh, been developed over a number of years, um, are used widely uh, in uh, various large-scale grids, for example, the Large Hadron Collider uh, computing grid, which was recently used to uh, uh, find uh, you know evidence of the the Higgs boson. Um, we've got a, we put together a few uh, um, data points here showing the extent to which the software is used. Um, so, well, the last in the last uh, one, well, not the last month, but February, we moved uh, 29 petabytes of data. I should say rather servers that have got usage reporting enabled. We built in usage reporting at National Science Foundation's uh, request, but not everyone enables it. It's easy to disable. But those for which uh, usage reporting is enabled transferred uh, 29 petabytes, performed 382 million uh, operations. Uh, the uh, last year, the Open Science Grid moved 169 million gram jobs. Uh, we, our usage reporting re reported 300,000 jobs uh, per day. Uh, you can see that those don't quite multiply out, so there are some servers that don't have usage reporting uh, enabled. Um, you know, my proxy servers are pretty widely deployed and, and service uh, millions of uh, requests uh, per, per year, in fact, millions of requests, uh, requests uh, per, per week. So over the last year, we've continued to uh, promote this uh, software, which the usage of which I'd say is gradually increasing. It's not increasing rapidly, but it's certainly not uh, declining. Um, we've released uh, four point releases of uh, Globus software, or GT 5.2, over the last year, uh, improving uh, stability as we keep uh, learning more ways in which services can fail, uh, and also expanding support for uh, Globus Online. Um, and I'll, we will say more about that in some of the talks that, that follow uh, today. So the sorts of things that people do with this, will they find the Higgs boson moving uh, petabytes of data? Uh, it's uh, built in, for example, into the uh, Earth System Grid uh, Federation software that's been uh, used to deliver 1.2 petabytes of climate data to 23,000 users worldwide. Uh, it supports uh, infrastructures like the LIGO uh, Scientific Collaboratory. Um, the Open Science Grid, it's used extensively in the Exceed uh, system, um, many other systems of, of this sort. Um, so, but the Earth System Grid Federation, we might say, is, is that, you know, in a sense, it's typical of a project in which uh, Globus is used. So it's a, it's a substantial project. It's been ongoing for uh, actually more than 10 years at this point. Uh, it involves a, you know, a, a strong central team that builds out sophisticated software, distributes it to people who deploy it, and then based on that software, they support a large number of, of users. So it's fairly specialized, domain specific. Uh, it works for the people who are either have a substantial infrastructure team to operate it, or who can make use of uh, the very specific Earth System grid. Um, uh, federation software. We, we, want, we might say, to use a contemporary uh, meme, that you know, this sort of project provides a robust infrastructure for the 1%, right? And uh, you know, the, I, I think I, I tell my friends in high energy physics, they're part of the 1% of science because they have you know, the 3,000 or so of them. They have the, the means, the resources, the time to build out a very sophisticated uh, IT infrastructure. But of course, most scientists uh, don't um, work in that uh, mode. They, they are the 99%, right, if you like. Uh, the ones who are working in a small lab, certainly they may want to uh, download some data from Earth System Grid, but they have other data sources that they want to combine. Uh, increasingly, they are dealing with uh, data volumes that might more characterize big science uh, projects in the past, thanks to uh, things like genome sequencing machines, new sorts of uh, experimental apparatus, large-scale simulations. So, so we, we, we like to say you know, they're, they're small labs, but they're trying to do uh, a big science. And so that's, those, this, these sort of considerations got us uh, thinking um, some years ago, about three years ago, I guess, um, 
we can, uh, w what do we do next? So we can keep refining the software that's used by the likes of the Earth System Grid, the Large Hadron Computing uh, Grid, the Open Science Grid, but they're always going to be serving a fairly uh, you know, small number of, of people. How do we reach many more uh, people who, many more, those people who are now starting to struggle with problems similar to those of the big science projects? It seemed to us that uh, in order to reach this goal, we needed to um, come up with a, in a sense, a new way of delivering research cyber infrastructure. For, so for many years, we'd done it basically, sort of sad to say this, but by tarballs, right? We'd produce software that people would have to download, uh, install, and operate. And once they'd done that, they became part of the uh, research uh, infrastructure. But that's a requires already a, fairly, a fair degree of specialization of knowledge uh, among uh, participants in, in this infrastructure. One would like to achieve something that was more frictionless, um, that you could use uh, without having to download tarballs and install them, that uh, didn't require specialized uh, local expertise. Um, so you know, it's not that the software we were delivering over these years cost anything, but it did require specialized computing infrastructure perhaps, and also specialized human expertise to make it operate. And we also were concerned about sustainability, uh, which I'll come back to uh, in a minute, because our, funding, our funders, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, the National Institutes of Health, they, they are consistently and correctly concerned with how the software they develop will be uh, sustained in, in the long term. So uh, some of us, of course, didn't, did things other than uh, work all the time, and so, so we asked ourselves, you know, we thought, well, what happens when we go home uh, and, and, and use uh, uh, cyber infrastructure at home? And we said, well, what if our research workflow could be as easily managed as, say, our, uh, our pictures? Um, uh, which, uh, as, as you most, maybe Flickr is not such a good example nowadays. Facebook you might use instead. But, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, not that long ago, my pictures were in a shoebox at home, and at, at work I had this very fancy... Uh, cyber infrastructure to use. Now I have this rather clunky cyber infrastructure at work and at home I can keep all my pictures in Flickr. I can uh, you know, mail, manage my mail using Gmail and um, I download movies using Netflix. So in a way we've flipped uh, the ease of use equation. I, I have better cyber infrastructure at home than I do at work. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, let's think. So what makes these services great? Well, sort of two things. Uh, one is they leverage uh, technology that sometimes people call Web 2.0, uh, right? They provide a great user experience. This is a term that uh, I've come to appreciate over the last uh, few years. Uh, um, so that you don't need to install any software to use any of these services. You simply, say for pictures, you well, upload them. Maybe you point, if you're using something like iTunes, you simply point uh, your uh, iTunes at some at your uh, music files, uh, and then under, behind the scenes there's this invisible cloud-based infrastructure which uh, makes things work. So, interesting question, what would it mean to do the same thing for uh, some of the research data management uh, functions that uh, we undertake? So that's what we've been working on uh, uh, in the, as we build out Globus Online, and uh, we're going to say a few words about this now, but, uh, oops, it's not supposed to go to do that, stay there. Uh, Here's the question which uh, we, we posed ourselves, although I don't think we used that, those terms when we started, but I think it's a good way of putting it. What would a Dropbox for science like, uh, look like? So most of you, many of you use Dropbox. Um, some of you use it uh, perhaps even uh, although your university or institutional policies tell you you shouldn't use it. Um, but you use it nonetheless because it's so uh, uh, wonderful, right? It lets you uh, share files. Uh, very conveniently with others, um, you know, manage permissions, um, uh, okay. synchronize between uh, different uh, machines to which you may be connected, okay. uh, etc. Very powerful capabilities, um, at least for small files. You probably don't use it for your terabyte uh, uh, climate simulation or, or genomic uh, sequence data. Um, so, what would a Dropbox for science look like? Well, it hopefully would be at least as easy to use as Dropbox. But it would also uh, do all these things here, uh, allow you to automate the collection process, you know, d data acquisition, uh, data movement, uh, synchronization, of course, controlled sharing, uh, hopefully also analysis, so 
why not uh, have something, a Dropbox sort of system, where when you upload a certain sort of data, it automatically gets uh, uh, annotated, uh, published, uh, analyzed, uh, etc. cetera. Um, it would allow you to search on the data that you'd uploaded to the system, perhaps provide for backup and archive services, and it would all do all this for uh, big data, not just for little megabyte uh, uh, files. So this is, uh, um, well, we call this uh, service, uh, you know, which we have taken the first steps towards developing. We certainly haven't got all of these pieces working. We call this uh, Globus Online. So let me uh, say a few words about that. Uh, you'll um, hear more about it from, from others. So basically, we, we adopted this concept of software as a service. So software as a service, uh, what does it mean? It's you know, well, Gmail, uh, Netflix, uh, Flickr are all exemplars. Uh, so are other things like Salesforce.com and, and many other capabilities that you may be less familiar with. Uh, there's a single version of whatever software it is that you're delivering in this mechanism that sits on a cloud service somewhere. Its state is also managed on a cloud service. There's a very convenient uh, Web 2.0-like interface, so you can access the service over the network. Uh, and then people are able to interact with that service without having to download any local software. And uh, this approach has a few advantages. It uh, certainly avoids the need for a certain degree of local expertise. If the remote access interface is well done, it makes the software easier to use. Um, it allows for very rapid support because the operator of the software can see exactly what's happening. They can see when errors occur and they can often deploy fixes very quickly, you know, within minutes perhaps of, of an error occurring. Um, and it also uh, then uh, can reduce cost because you end up operating one version of the software for everyone rather than having to build many different versions for different end user platforms. And uh, I think we've found that many of those advantages do indeed apply in our case. Um, the software, of course, that we're developing, delivering here is not uh, photo management or video streaming. It's research data management software. Um, and uh, you know, what, what, what's, what I think we found interesting is we started off really focusing on software as a service as a means of simplifying life for researchers. Soft researchers who have to manage, for example, the movement of data from one place to another. But we've pr quickly found that resource owners and system administrators are also uh, excited about this technology because it allows them to improve the experience that the users of their resources uh, have. And we'll say more about that uh, in a minute. OK, so uh, a few words about what we're trying to do. So this is sort of a schematic, schematic some of you may have seen it before, of the research data management problem, if you like, you know, data being collected in one place, uh, you know, s s perhaps, uh, you know, from a scientific instrument or a simulation stage somewhere for a little while, then being uh, uh, you know, moved off to another place for uh, initial processing. Perhaps there's some analysis that occurs at this point. Uh, ultimately, after refinement and improvement, the data may be catalogued, published, uh, shared with others. Um, later on, it may be archived or mirrored. Uh, remote users may come in and perform further analysis. Uh, so I, I think with appropriate interpretations of each of these arrows and, and uh, circles or boxes, you can you know, map many application workflows uh, onto this, uh, onto this uh, general uh, picture. Um, so of course, you know, in principle, this, these should be easy. I mean, it's easy usually to describe the research workflow that underpins some science project, but it's often hard and frustrating to implement it, um, and often for rather mundane reasons, right? So uh, you might find, oh, oh gosh, my quotas exceeded here, uh, my credentials have expired, or I can't remember what they are. Um, uh, the network fails, there's a firewall uh, problem, um, I'm permission denied, um, oh, I want to be able to create a registry, and, and I've, you know, I want to keep track of my data, but I, I don't know how to set up a database to, to do that other problems that uh, you, you could easily add to this list. So these are these sort of yellow uh, triangles and many others are the sorts of problems that you know, we feel uh, are amenable to automation. So uh, you know, for example, if the network fails and you need to retry, well, let's just retry it for someone. Um, 
If uh, permission is denied, will that suggest that uh, you, know, you don't have uh, appropriate, perhaps, uh, credential uh, management in place or, or mechanisms for uh, allowing users rather than system administrators to manage who's allowed to access uh, data? So Globus Online basically seeks to automate many of these research data management uh, problems. So the first thing we, we, we've been sort of over the last three years you know, s moving slowly and, and methodically through a set of uh, these problems and, and automate, developing automated solutions to them one by one. So we started off with the, you know, the, I would say the deceptively perhaps simple task of reliable, secure, high performance file transfer. We noted that many uh, projects, um, and our, ourselves included, had over the years built little custom packages to manage the movement of data from A to B. Uh, you know, this could be uh, well, when I tell my children about what we're doing here, they say, couldn't you just email the files that you're trying to send? Well, sometimes email is fine, but sometimes you want to move, uh, you know, a million files or you want to move a very large, uh, you know, terabyte file. Uh, files that, uh, you know, between uh, sites that, uh, that perhaps, uh, you know, as we've said earlier, have differing uh, security policies and so forth. And, and then uh, one finds that... Uh, this apparently simple data movement problem becomes difficult. And so we see various groups have built tools to manage this process. Other people, uh, perhaps uh, more impatient, have simply told a grad student or a yeah. postdoc that this is their job. It's to make sure that yeah. these files get moved and they sit there and spend uh, uh, weeks perhaps managing uh, uh, data movement uh, uh, problems. Uh, and perhaps eventually they end up building their own script because it, the whole thing is too painful. So um, Globus Online, uh, you know, the first uh, set of capabilities that we offered allows people to uh, basically hand off that management process uh, to uh, this host cloud hosted service that actually sits on Amazon computers, uh, although that's you know not relevant uh, to uh, or, or visible to the user. Uh, the user initiates a transfer request. They use a nice web interface, or they use a command line interface, or a REST interface. Uh, Globus Online then uh, works out what needs to be moved. Uh, performs configuration and optimization, and sometimes this can be quite sophisticated, uh, sometimes quite simple. For example, we'll decide uh, you know, how many concurrent transfers to perform. Uh, if we're moving between mass storage systems, we'll uh, perhaps order transfers to uh, uh, minimize uh, tape movement. Um, we'll uh, set up uh, network uh, configuration options, uh, initiates the transfer, the transfer proceeds for a you know, short amount of time or a long amount of time. The longest I think we've seen has been about three months, um, a very large amount of data between two mass storage systems. The shortest will be you know, less than a second. A and then uh, if problems occur, Globus Online retries, uh, et cetera, and eventually uh, it notifies the user uh, when things are, are finished. So this is the Globus Online service we've been running for a while. We have up to, uh, I think, about more than 8,000 users. We've moved close to a billion files, about 15 uh, petabytes of, of data. Uh, more recently, and we'll be showing this in a second, uh, we've uh, started to extend this to address uh, file sharing. So we, we observe that uh, once someone gets some data somewhere, um, and I, I guess the mouse doesn't move here. Oh, here it is. Once someone gets some data somewhere, um, well, sometimes you just want to keep it to yourself, but uh, especially if you're a good scientist, you want to share it with your colleagues. And uh, how do you share data with people? Well, it used to be that you'd sort of proceed as follows. Uh, I mean, you might be able to put it on a website, but more often you'd say, okay, I'll get you an account on my server, and, uh, and then you can log in and, and transfer it. Okay, and how do you get an account on the server? Well, first of all, you've got to go and speak to the system administrator and it rapidly becomes a, a, a time-consuming process. So um, Globus Sharing, uh, as we call Globus Online Sharing, sort of over overcomes that problem. It allows a user to come in and uh, simply select a file, a set of files, a set of uh, folders uh, to uh, share, select a user or group, and the ability to define groups is very important, so you can define a group of collaborators, uh, and set permissions, uh, and then uh, well, Globus Online manages all of the uh, subsequent uh, access control and sharing. Um, so, in a sense, it gives you the Dropbox sharing capability, but without having to move your data to cloud storage, which, you know, if you've got a terabyte of data, you probably don't want to do. Uh, 
um, because it would be very expensive. It also actually gives you a more sophisticated uh, sharing control than, than, uh, than Dropbox. For example, you can allow people to access data but not to uh, delete it. Uh, some people, I think, have come across this problem of people deleting files in Dropbox. You can uh, specify that uh, you know, someone can uh, access the data but can't delegate access rights to other people and so forth. And uh, you know, the user, whoever is shared with, then logs into uh, uh, Globus Online and accesses shared files. So I think this is going to be, uh, we've just rolled this out at a few sites so far. I think people are going to find this uh, very exciting. So at this point, we're going to do a quick uh, demo of uh, of what's of Globus Online, uh, and uh, hopefully get you more excited about it even than I've managed to do. So I think Steve Tiki is going to do this. Is this right, Steve? Yep. yep. Okay. So demonstration. <coughs> okay. All right. Looks like the mic's working. Good. Thanks, Ian. So what I'm going to do is a quick demo of uh, Globus Online and particularly the new sharing functionality that Ian just talked about. So if I switch over. Let me get out of here. And looks like it messed up all the uh, window sizing and, and uh, screen resolution, everything on this. So that's going to make things slightly harder here. Give me one second. PowerPoint likes to change resolutions on the screen. So let me just up it a little bit here to get it to something that will actually show the entire screen. Let's do, uh, that should be enough to do it. There we go. Good. Sorry about that. All right. Now, what we've got here in a browser is, of course, Globus Online, which I can sign into uh, as a user, but we've got a new feature uh, that Ian's will also talk about in a moment that we call branding of websites. So we can say sort of create custom sites or custom skins really to Globus Online for various sites. So just to give an example of that, um, <clears throat> this is the skin for the University of Chicago's Research Computing Center site. And what you're looking at here is simply Globus Online, right? It's just our normal, normal service but with an alternate interface on it that looks just like the Research Computing Center site at, uh, at University of Chicago's RCC. But the other thing you notice on the login is we've changed the default login. Rather than a normal Globus Online login to the service, uh, we can instead tie this into other federated identities. So we have a whole bunch of them now that we support. For example, InCommon, any InCommon university can do this. Um, but then we also have a variety of other sites like NERSC and, and ALCF, Exeter, you'll hear a talk from, uh, I think, later today. So a variety of different sites. The big advantage of this is I can now get single sign-on as an end user across my research computing center, across Globus Online, and across the various grid of peace servers that I want to access. So if I proceed, this is going to redirect me out through the CI logon service out to the University of Chicago's login page, right? So this is my normal University of Chicago account. I get single sign-on to this and any other web pages that use this provider, and now I'm logged into Globus Online, right? So now I see a start transfer page, and now everything else is as you'd expect with Globus Online if you've, if you've used it at all. So I can go, for example, to the UCRCC endpoints, um, like this sharing one, and again, I have single sign-on to that because it'll take the CI logon credential from InCommon and actually use that to go all the way to the GridFTP server at the endpoint. So if you're a university that uses InCommon, we've now got all the bits and pieces with our new version of Globus Connect multi-user that allows you to do this sort of end-to-end -end single sign-on against your own resources there. And once you're there, of course, it's Globus Online. So I can do transfers, you know, say from this, this is a GPFS file system running on a, on a HPC cluster at the University of Chicago with a normal grid FTP server, um, normal newer version. And then, uh, I don't know, let's go out to another site like uh, Exceed. I know I've got uh, login out at Trestles, which is a supercomputer at San Diego. And let's take, let's go into this My Project folder that I have there and copy across the big directory. Take, I've got a GT directory here with a whole bunch of data in it. So we'll take that and transfer it across. 
All right, so we've just fired that up. I can check how it's doing you know, and see that it's now drilling in, starting to figure out what to do, right? So it's that easy to move things across supercomputing centers. I've also got on this laptop, it's a little hard to see because the menu is up there, Globus Connect you know, model, just kind of like Dropbox, right? Where you put an agent on your machine in the background that connects your machine to the cloud. And Dropbox connects their cloud. We have Globus Connect that connects to, of course, the Globus Online cloud. So I can also do things like you know, fire up a second transfer of saying, let's go take, you know, let's take, uh, what should we do? We'll take from my own machine over here. So this is the Globus Connect running on my machine on this, and we'll download this Go Data directory to my laptop, right? So just trying to make it really easy to move your data around everywhere you want. But of course, as Ian said, what I'd even like to do more so is share my data with other people, right? I'd like to share it with particular other users. To show that, let me go back into here, and I'm in this My Project folder. We have a new option available within this drop-down menu of share. Right? And if I click this, what I see is I've already got one share created off this site, but let's go ahead and create a new one. So what I can do is say, I want to take this server, right, this normal GPFS file system out there that I can log into, and take a particular directory from it, my My Project directory, and share it out to other Globus Online users, whether they have an account on the University of Chicago's RCC machine or not. Right? And so I'll call this my project share, just to give it a name. So just like every system that you talk to in Globus Online, it has an endpoint name. So I'll go ahead and create it. And now it's an endpoint, right? And it's, you can see just here, that's the new endpoint name. And it's really just sort of a virtual name, sort of a virtual change-rooted overlay on that existing system, right? So unlike a cloud system like Dropbox, where you have to have third-party sort of centralized storage through which all data goes, what we've enabled is that same simplicity of sharing, but from your own storage directly, so that you don't have to incur the financial costs, the transfer bandwidth, the, the time involved with moving all that data to some third-party cloud service. You can do it directly from your own servers. Right? And so having done that, it's now just an endpoint. So I can go to it now like any other endpoint, do things in it. Right? So that should look an awful lot the same because it's the same, you know, it's, just, it's just different sort of virtual names for the same directory. But now having done that, of course, I can share it. So I can say, let's share this. I've got another user, SJT, um, that I'll share that out to. I'll give read-write permissions to it. So if I pop over to another browser, I logged in earlier. In this other browser, you can see as GSJT user over here. So let me just go into the start transfer window. And now, once it loads, there's that endpoint that I just created. I go to it, and now I have access to it. And now I can use this as SJT, just like any other endpoint, even though SJT does not have an account directly on this resource. So for example, um, I've got my laptop sitting over there that's running in Globus Connect on it. So let's go ahead and take a file from my laptop and upload that into I'll stick it in this experiment one directory for the fun of it. Right? So we'll take a couple files here and upload them over here. Right? So everything else is the same at this point. So that's the first step uh, of sharing. Right? Make it really easy to share out to individual users. But of course, in our community, we work in projects a lot. Right? So what we'd also like is the ability to take you know, portions of this shared endpoint. So take, for example, this experiment one directory that's in my shared endpoint and share this out to a group of users, not just to a single user. So I can do that, right? I can say, if I go over you know, into here, select it, share it. Let me go ahead and remove the SJT one, just so you can see, right? If I refresh the page over here, you'll see now SJT no longer has access, right? So the access control is immediate against these resources. But what I'll do now is go out and reshare to a group. So to support this, we've added a whole new capability to Globus Online that's also now in beta testing of group management. As an end user, I can create my own groups. I can define my policies for who's, how people join the group, who can join the group. And then, of course, I can do things with that group. So for example, I created this Globus team group where you know, I'm the administrator of it, so I can Again, do everything myself through this web interface, you know, you know, add to the description of my group, 
I have members in my group that I can see, some pending approval for admissions, some who are active members. I can create subgroups of my groups. Um, so for example, my Globus team group, I've got subgroups for my development team and my user services team, and all the relation, you know, subgroup relationships are maintained across that. And a variety of settings that I can control on it, things like who is the group visible to. I can say it's visible to all logged in users or only to group members. So if I want to keep kind of groups more hidden, who are members visible to? Maybe I want to see, well, members to see other members of the group, but not end users or not, you know, people who are not part of the group. You can say who's allowed to create subgroups in this group. Uh, who can send invitations to join? Um, who can request membership in groups? So for example, yesterday I created this Globus tutorial group and made it an open group that anybody could join. And so a bunch of people joined that yesterday. And then sort of the approval policies, right? So lots of capabilities for controlling and managing my groups. And then, of course, I can invite people to groups either by email address. So I could type in like vas at, at ci.uchicago.edu and send an invitation off to him. He'll now get an email in his inbox with a link he can follow to join the group or sign up for Globus Online account if he doesn't have one. Or I can search for people. So like if I search for Rachana, I can find various accounts. It looks like she's got a few different accounts here and say, let's click this one and send an invitation to her. Right? So various capabilities, uh, looks like Vast may have already done the email. So if I go back to members, there you see Vass's you know, invitation pending. Oh, no, there's Raj. Oh yeah, the, the email invites we don't have showing up here yet. But having done that, now I can use it, right? I can use it for sharing. So say I want to take this experiment one directory and only share out this one directory to this project team, this project group that I just created. I can go in here, hit share. You notice now the path that I'm sharing is just the experiment one directory. I jump over to the search, search for Globus team. That'll pull up various groups that you know, match you know, through its description or anything else that mentions Globus and the like. So you can see there's the information about the group right, that I was just showing over there. So let's go ahead and add permissions for the Globus team. So now we can see the Globus team has rights to access this one directory. And this Globus team group, just to show it, one of the members of that group is SJT also. Right? So we see right here, SJT is member of group. So what I just did is gave SJT access, but now only to that one directory within that shared endpoint, since I only shared out that experiment one directory. Right? And so again, now it's just an endpoint, and I can do everything with it. So that's what we got for our new group functionality. I'll turn it back to Ian. I just need to turn on. Okay, I'm turned on. So, so I hope you thought that was cool. Um, these are, you know, the, some of these things that we're doing here, uh, making it possible to do with uh, just a few mouse clicks are things that. You know, people have spent a lot of time over the years uh, building uh, vertical solutions for in the context of various uh, collaborative uh, and grid computing solutions. So we're pretty excited that we're getting to the point where these can be delivered as hosted services. Um, and I'll, co I'll come back a little bit at the end just to point out that you know, these services that underpin uh, what Steve just showed can be used, of course, to facilitate sharing in Globus uh, online, but also can be used for other purposes as well. Anyway, let me uh, now say a bit more about Globus Online. So we started, uh, we first announced this uh, in November 2010, I think it was. Yeah, so it's a while ago. And uh, you know, it took a while for people to start using it. So, so th this, uh, you read it from the bottom up. You know, so it took 309 days for the first petabyte of data to be moved. And we were very excited when it clicked over uh, a petabyte. Uh, and then you can see, you know, 169 days for the next petabyte, 121, uh, and so forth. Uh, most recently, um, we're, we've got up to 15 petabytes, so it took us 701 days for 0 to 5, uh, 229 uh, for, uh, for, uh, to get to 10, and we even had a, uh, see if I can make this work here, I did a little, I captured it on my screen. We were, a few of us were watching, right, so you could actually see it click over, so that was a ne The next time we get to do that is when we get to 100 petabytes, which I think will be, well, we're not sure when it will be. It depends how much uh, it continues uh, accelerating, but 
as you can see, it only took us uh, 82 days to get from 10 to 15 petabytes. OK, so that's, you can replay it if you, if you want. Um, so, and during this time, we've also grown from zero to about well, 8,000 users last time I, I counted. Uh, so uh, part of you know, what we're seeing is more users uh, using the system, uh, also uh, more people using it equally importantly to move more data. You know, so uh, uh, partly uh, because of the ease of use of Globus Online, partly I think because of other factors, for example, the, the fact that uh, people are deploying science DMZ-like systems based on the uh, specs from ESnet. Uh, people are realizing they can move more data more rapidly. And so you know, the, the amount of data moved by individuals is also increasing uh, rapidly as well. So you know, some of the, just a few little uh, success stories, you know, this is Katrin Heitman. We recruited her to Argon from uh, Los Alamos, and she wanted to move some data. She was able to move it uh, um, from Los Alamos uh, in, uh, at a, up to five gigabits per second. Uh, it was totally seamless. The only challenge that uh, she faced was when the Los Alamos network people thought there was some sort of denial of service attack going on because so much data was being moved over their networks. They weren't used to it. But uh, um, another, this is, a, 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 I think, a student at UCLA, you know, moving 900,000 file uh, data sets from one place to another, uh, from UCLA to NERSC, and I, I think back again. Um, you know, so moving 900,000 files, not easy, but for them was, was straightforward. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the biggest single user, at least until recently, was uh, uh, Dan Kozak from Caltech, who uh, used Globus Online to replicate a petabyte of data uh, across the uh, country uh, for resilience uh, purposes. So this was a, a multi-month process, but the whole thing was done reasonably uh, easily. So lots of people are, allowed to, uh, are now able to move data rapidly, reliably, um, and securely from one place to another. Uh, now, you know, in a sense, this is putting into people's hands the tools that the likes of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, people always had. They always had this machinery for moving data from one place to another. Now anyone uh, can, can easily deploy it. Um, but the other thing we've, we've, we've uh, been working on, which I think is equally important and, and subtly different. We're not, we're not just making it easy to move data between you know, UCLA and NERSC or uh, Argonne and Oak Ridge, um, but also addressing the last mile uh, challenge. So th this used to be, I think for many people, one of the biggest uh, problems uh, with data movement. Uh, okay, you can move data from one big center to another big center, but ultimately you often want to move data into your own lab or maybe out of your lab, and then you face uh, problems of having, well clearly you have to install software, it, you can't avoid doing something uh, if you're going to move data to your own desktop machine or your own lab machine, a and you're probably in an environment that's somewhat unfriendly with firewalls and, 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 and so forth. So uh, this, this last mile problem was a significant uh, challenge. You might even say the last, in many cases, the last uh, 10 yards or meters. Um, so we've been addressing this also uh, via something we called Globus Connect, which was released uh, now about 18 months ago. Um, and Globus Connect uh, is, well, Steve mentioned it. You know, he showed the little thing on his uh, laptop uh, in his, uh, the status bar. Uh, it's, uh, you know, at the technology level, it's basically grid FTP uh, packaged up into a, you know, one-click install uh, system for Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux, but also with some subtle uh, differences that allow it to negotiate uh, firewalls effectively. For example, rather than sitting there waiting for incoming control messages, it, it interacts with a Globus Online server to request uh, control um, messages telling it to do things, so you can avoid uh, some of the, or many of the firewall uh, problems. So uh, Globus Connect is, is something that makes it trivial to interact to engage your laptop into a Globus Online uh, network, basically, to make it an endpoint, um, an endpoint you know, that uh, can participate fully in, in data movement uh, operations. Um, and uh, well, just mention briefly, you, some of you may remember also that if you wanted to deploy a grid FTP server, you used to have to get an X509 cert and all this stuff, and it was 
a little bit complicated, um, let's say very complicated, uh, that is now also totally automated. The only thing you do to establish the identity of your new Globus Connect endpoint is you, you, when you register it, you get a string which you then cut and paste into your, uh, when you start up the Globus Connect endpoint for the first time. So it's really nicely uh, an integration. So Globus Connect addresses the needs of an individual who wants to take their own machine and uh, uh, turn it uh, into a Globus uh, online endpoint. Uh, the other, uh, but of course, as I said earlier, there are sort of two classes of people that are important, uh, or two groups, they're not certainly ordered classes, two groups of people that are, end up being important when you're trying to do this sort of thing. One is the user, the researcher. Uh, the other is the uh, system administrator, the operator of computing systems. So, you know, the, the world is full of you know, mid-range computing systems and storage systems that people want to enable access to. You know, a typical university will have uh, uh, you know, several, maybe many of them. You know, our, at the University of Chicago, our research computing center is, is one such. So we, we also uh, have been creating, or we did create something called Globus Connect multi-user. So this is, uh, in a sense, like Globus Connect. It's something that you download and install um, and uh, make, create an endpoint, but in this case you're creating an endpoint that is, n that is not accessible just to one person, the owner of the computer, but to potentially many people, uh, perhaps anyone who has an account uh, on that system. And uh, the way we do this with the implementation level, we're bundling up uh, Grid FTP and MyProxy and some other uh, components. Um, again, it's though pretty much one click install, there is a, it's a sort of maybe a five minute uh, process. Um, what we're doing is uh, you know, allowing a research provider, making it very easy for a research, a resource provider to take their computer cluster or their storage system and turn it into something that uh, people can access remotely, if you like, or equivalently, you know, that allows people, their local users who operate on that system uh, to uh, engage, for example, transferring uh, data to remote locations. So uh, Craig Stewart and others like to talk about campus bridging as a, as a goal for cyber infrastructure, making it easy for people to move seamlessly between their local computing system, you know, in their lab, their campus, and the national cyber infrastructure. So that's what uh, Globus Connect multi-user does. So, I mean, you weren't you know, Steve was sort of messing around, moving things back and forth, and well, he was, you, you weren't really aware of the fact that at one point he was on uh, a, his laptop, at another point he was on a computer in San Diego, another point he was at the campus system at the University of Chicago. It's the same, uh, you know, ease of, same, the same user experience, the same seamless uh, movement of data, uh, regardless of where you're located. So that's, I think, a significant uh, step forward. So these are all good things to provide to, uh, for a campus to provide to its users. The other thing that people, uh, campuses end up liking is the reduced so support burden. Because uh, if you make it um, easy for people to move data in and out of your system, they don't come and ask you uh, how to do it. Um, if you make it easy for them to share data with people, then they don't come and keep asking you to give people accounts just for the purposes of data sharing, uh, et cetera. So, uh, Globus Connect multi-user, uh, I think, is pretty exciting. You should get started now, as we say. You can probably, before I, I'm finished here, you can probably get it running on your uh, campus cluster if any of you have a campus cluster to install it on. And uh, we're getting a, a pretty large number of sites that are deploying it. This is a somewhat old slide, but it lists some of the uh, places that have uh, deployed uh, Globus Connect multi-user. Um, some of them are... Uh, as you'll see, universities, some national labs, exceed as a national cyber infrastructure project, um, some in the US, uh, some internationally, um, and, and so forth. A lot of, uh, a lot of um, people using it. Okay, so that's uh, almost the end of talking about technology. I'm gonna say a bit more uh, a little bit later. Uh, but, so we've talked about Globus Online, uh, uh, transfer and sharing, uh, we've talked about um, this Globus Connect and Globus Connect multi-user. Now I'd like to say a few words about the third bullet at the beginning. Remember I talked about the desire to address, um, what was it, uh, you know, seamless, 
affordable and sustainable uh, cyber infrastructure. The first word was not seamless, but anyway, something like that. Um, but sustainability, I want to say a few words about some ideas we're pursuing with respect to uh, sustainability. Uh, you know, so we've been developing at the University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab cyber infrastructure software for uh, more than 15 years. And well, certainly we've succeeded in providing stuff that thousands of people uh, find useful. But it's nevertheless an ongoing struggle, and I know other people here struggle with these things, uh, also to find a way to continue support of this software. Um, we've tried various approaches over the years. We've tried uh, um, the open source community approach, which has been helpful, but uh, did not produce you know, 100 people who wanted to devote their lives to supporting uh, software for free. Uh, and enhancing software for free. We've tried creating a uh, for-profit company, uh, Univa, um, which uh, you know, also has had some success, but didn't end up finding uh, the research market a profitable place uh, to, uh, to sell software to. And so uh, you know, we've, 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 we're currently looking at a different approach to sustainability, which is based on the notion that, well, in the uh, commercial world, it's called the freemium model, you provide some amount of service, uh, basic service to people uh, for, uh, for free, and then you provide some enhanced services uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, a, for a modest fee. And we, our belief is that, just to go back up, we're the, by doing this in a non-profit environment, um, we can do it uh, particularly cost-effectively, because we won't be forced to uh, uh, try and make large amounts of money off it. So, uh, We've been do we're pursuing a couple of approaches here, and, and this is, uh, and I'll, we'll, you'll hear more about them uh, later in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the meeting, but the first is what we call the provider plans, um, which uh, basically, uh, and I think there's a little thing down, no, there's not, no, we'll come back to it. Uh, basically, we, we, the provider plan, so anyone who operates a Globus Connect multi-user service is a, uh, is a resource provider. Right, for in our terminology. Uh, and you can download that software and use it for free, as I said. But what we're looking at is, is uh, adding some value-added capabilities. For example, the ability to, uh, as I say here, um, monitor usage, uh, optimize particular for particular sorts of mass storage systems, uh, provided branded websites, and, and so forth. Things that some sites, uh, and actually quite a few sites, it seems, uh, find uh, uh, potentially valuable, and, and uh, Steve Tiki is going to say more about uh, that uh, later on. The other uh, thing we're examining, uh, with some support from NSF, who are really pushing us on this uh, issue of sustainability, uh, is uh, to uh, provide some enhanced uh, end-user uh, plan. So everything, um, all the file movement stuff is continues to be free, will be free, and perpetuity, but we're also uh, looking at uh, providing, and here sort of trying to pursue a Dropbox model, uh, adding this ability to create and manage shared endpoints and peer-to-peer -peer transfers, uh, Globus to Connect to Globus Connect as something that can be obtained for a modest price. So we're going to, in a sense, these are experiments. We want to see what people are prepared uh, to pay for, um, but uh, we, we have hopes that this will allow us to address these is ongoing issues of sustainability. Okay, so let's see. The last uh, thing I wanted to talk about was, and you'll hear more about this also in later presentations, is uh, where we're going with Globus Online, first of all, and secondly, uh, how we uh, are starting to see people use Globus Online as a platform as well as just a service. So you know, everything we've talked about up to now uh, uh, Globus transfer, Globus sharing, these are things that you, uh, you as a user interact with uh, to move data, to share data, uh, and so forth. Um, but under the covers, there's also uh, you know, some, other, there's, uh, some other machinery. Uh, there's uh, a transfer service and a sharing service which has a REST API. Uh, so that's what drives the website. It can also be used to drive other things. There's uh, what we call Globus Nexus, which is our, the, the, um, the service inside Globus Online that manages identities, credentials, and groups. And that also has a REST API. So you can use these things, uh, if you like, um, to, uh, you can use the APIs directly to build value-added services of your own. And we're going to hear about a few people who are doing that. 
KBASE, uh, the DOE uh, knowledge base, uh, systems biology knowledge base, uh, is using our uh, identity and group management services. Uh, so that it allows them to offload, if you like, outsource the management of identities and groups to us uh, so that they don't have to focus on that, uh, those issues. The University of Exeter, uh, we'll also hear from them, are uh, using the transfer and other services to provide some value-added data management services. And uh, we'll say a few words about Globus Genomics in a minute. This is another service that we ourselves are building that leverages some of these underpinning uh, services um, in order to provide uh, enhanced uh, genomic uh, data analysis capabilities. Um, one other th thing where well, so that's, that's sort of one thing I wanted to get you thinking about, how you might use Globus Online APIs to drive your own services, what you might be able to outsource to a, a third party, uh, if you like, in order to uh, reduce the complexity and cost of operating these things uh, for yourselves. Uh, we've all already heard about how Globus Connect allows uh, both individuals and sites, uh, these are some example sites, to, uh, if you like, outsource the task of uh, providing high-performance, secure, reliable data movement in and out of uh, uh, their storage systems. Um, the one other thing that you'll hear more about uh, a little bit later from uh, Carl Kesselman and, uh, and Kyle Chard is um, some things that we're exploring that are still uh, more experimental, a set of uh, data set services. So let me just say one sentence about those. So uh, as people, you know, we've, we've noted that as I said, people move data from one place to another. Uh, they want to be able to share data with other people. Uh, they currently, we do all of those things in terms of files and folders. So those are you know, constructs that make sense in terms of how data may be organized on a local uh, file system, but they're not constructs that make sense uh, in terms of science. You know, a science project tends to work in collections of files and folders, uh, and perhaps also metadata associated with those things. So our data set services are taking steps towards allowing people to define, uh, annotate, share, manipulate collections of data that we call data sets. And so you'll hear more about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, let me say a few words about Globus Genomics, though. Um, so this is a, a project that we started working on with some uh, local users uh, who uh, faced challenges relating to uh, uh, analysis of genomic uh, data. So I don't know if you can see the details on this picture, but it's uh, basically it's you know, sort of making the point that you know, in a sense, this is addressing, if you like, a vertical set of concerns that a particular set of s small lab researchers face. Uh, so it seems like every you know, major research university nowadays in its biological sciences division or whatever it's called uh, in, in a particular university will have some researchers who have got funding to sequence um, a set of uh, genomes uh, you know, in pursuit of some research uh, goal. Uh, they found someone to sequence them. Often it's a third-party uh, sequencing service, commercial or non-profit. And then they suddenly face the problem of having to analyze that data. So how are they going to do it? Well, one approach which uh, you know, they may pursue is to uh, hire a postdoc, buy some computers, spend six months installing the appropriate software and learning how to use it, um, and then go ahead with the analysis. Another approach that we're finding people want to undertake uh, is to outsource uh, the, perform the analysis on Amazon computers rather than local computers, uh, which gives them greater flexibility, is more rapid uh, to, to access, etc. Uh, and then uh, use, if they're not really trying to innovate on the software side, use a predefined analysis pipeline uh, to perform their analysis. And this is what Globus Genomics basically uh, provides you. It, uh, uh, it builds on a set of technologies, Globus Online, uh, uh, Galaxy, which is a widely used genomic pipeline analysis uh, software, um, uh, Amazon Cloud Services, um, and uh, allows people to basically point at where their data is. For example, it might be on a server at a uh, company like Perkin Elmer, which provides commercial uh, data transfer, commercial g sequencing services. Uh, you know, say what analysis they want to perform, and then Globus Genomics is manages the movement of data from, their, from the source to uh, 
the destination, the Amazon uh, computing system, runs an analysis pipeline and presents them with results. And so you can be sequencing data within literally you know, minutes rather than uh, the months that might otherwise be required to uh, uh, install things. So you'll, you'll hear more about uh, that later, um, I think later today, in fact. Okay, so that's my, uh, the finish of my presentation. I do want to thank a couple of, a few people. First of all, the work of people who work on the core Globus technologies uh, is supported by a number of different sources. Some of them, uh, I guess most of them listed here. Uh, of course, the people, many other people here are going to be talking right. about work they do with Globus and their own work, and that is supported by many other sources. I, I do want to thank uh, that we have two sponsors for uh, this meeting, which has allowed us to, depending on your perspective, either keep the registration fees low or have better events, um, maybe a bit of each. Uh, so thank you very much to EMC Isilon and to uh, Data Direct Networks, both uh, obviously concerned with the ability to move data fast and store it reliably and, and efficiently. Uh, and then let me say a few words about the, the, the uh, rest of the program. So we've got a pretty full schedule. As you can see, we've decided to keep this as a single track meeting because I, I think that you know, for this number of people, it makes it more, uh, more fun. So that means we couldn't fit in all the talks that people wanted to give, but I think we've got a pretty interesting set. So, uh, you know, some people talking about Globus Online experiences, quite a wide variety. You know, Exeter, I already mentioned, NERSC is making heavy use of Globus Online for their own, uh, to manage data movement in and out of their site. The University of Michigan was a early adopter uh, of Globus Online, has several uh, servers uh, running. Uh, the Technical University, uh, Dortmund, uh, then we've got a couple of talks talking about the, the data set services and the genomic services that I mentioned briefly on, on the preceding slide. A and then uh, some real deep dives into uh, some particular uh, technological, technological approaches that people are pursuing. Uh, ESNet, NCSA, Fermilab, and, and uh, the DOE uh, systems biology uh, knowledge base. Tomorrow we've got uh, David Lifka from Cornell giving a, a keynote talking to us about his experiences, among other things, of providing a uh, sustainable uh, computing infrastructure for, for Cornell, one that's not dependent on the vagaries of, of federal uh, funding. Uh, we'll update you on where we're going, uh, have a couple more providers talking about their experiences, and then a set of uh, community groups who want to tell us a bit about what they're doing. The, uh, the uh, EGCF, which is the European Grid Community Forum. I got that right, the Open Grid Forum, uh, San Diego uh, Supercomputer Center, which is doing some interesting work with storage services, and the University of uh, Indiana. So that's what we're doing, I hope. And of course, tonight, as you'll hear later, we've got a nice event at the uh, planetarium. So hopefully, many of you will come to that. OK, so questions or comments, criticisms, Wishes, dreams. Uh, yes, David, thank you. Yeah. But if, let's say you have a popular data set. Yes. Um, maybe some you know, additional layers of robustness around it. I guess yeah. I'm actually thinking of like the, uh, the early days of shareware on the yes. internet where, yeah. you, you know, there was a list of mirrors. No, so the question is what about attaching multiple endpoints to a, a data set? And those are things that we are certainly uh, thinking about, talking about uh, from two different perspectives. One is, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a data set, uh, you know, whatever collection of, so the, you know, our goal, you'll hear more about this from Carl, but our goal as a data set is a assembly of data that makes sense to you. And that data could include, you know, say, maybe image data and ge genome data and, and other stuff. And that those individual components could be at different endpoints. So why not? You know, so that makes sense. Uh, but the other thing is, of course, you might want to be able to uh, specify that a certain data set is replicated. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the services that we, uh, uh, are talking about implementing, so it might be replicated for pur purposes of performance or for, for robustness. Uh, we've done work of that sort in the past, uh, you know, working with, uh, for example, the LIGO group, uh, Scott Carander and, and co, 
uh, Anne Shevanak built out uh, you know, a, a replication service. Um, so there's no reason why those sorts of capabilities shouldn't, couldn't be layered underneath uh, this data set uh, concept. It's really just a question of uh, t time and money, I guess, basically, to d make it happen. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I have uh, um, two questions sort of related to that. One would be um, sort of going beyond replication, yeah. uh, going to, um, <coughs> Let's say a data set was big enough that you didn't want to do a full replication, but you want to do something like, like erasure coding, yeah. um, where the entire data set was actually across a number of different places, but it was uh, resilient to any one particular failure, and you could yep. do, do different layers of that rather than simply a replication service. I'm hoping yes. maybe that's uh, something you're, you're exploring. But um, uh, the other one gets into the idea of you know, what if a data set, what if an element of a data set isn't a file? Um, you know, I, guess, I guess maybe when you talk about Globus, um, Genomics, maybe this gets into it a little bit of, you know, what if you've got something like, you know, a database or you've got, um, uh, you've got provenance information or you've yep. got stuff that, that doesn't really fit within a POSIX file system uh, type of model. Have you, you guys exploring uh, things like that? Yeah, these are great setup questions for the talk that Carl will give and, and Kyle will give. So maybe I should leave it to them. Carl and Kyle, is that okay? because otherwise I'll give too much of their talk. Uh, so, right, so these are exactly the concerns we want to address. Clearly, people, it's nice to manage files, but you really want to do much more. And, and, and then on the other hand, once you start managing uh, more of da people's data movement and location, you can start to uh, collect provenance information that you know, might not otherwise be easily accessible. So I think the, the, that's a good question from multiple perspectives. The issue of eraser coding, uh, I mean, I'm, it's not something we've discussed. I, I think it's an interesting question. Do you try and build that into a data set service or do you rely, do you hand that off to someone else who might do it for you? I mean, there are you know, commercial and non-commercial systems that do a good uh, replication using erasure coding and we could easily imagine data being stored in those systems. So I, I'm not sure what the right approach to take is. Yeah. Support for searching of data, software, say, yeah. uh, different sites may already have their own types of data and may already have their own mechanism for right. searching of yeah, yeah. data. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, an, again, a, a wonderful question for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for Carl and Kyle. I, I, was, I knew they, were gonna, they had all the interesting stuff to talk about. But, uh, right, so one thing we're, uh, so we're, this is a, so the, we're very concerned with this, uh, this question. So, um, Clearly, once you start uh, organizing data for people, people want to be able to search on that data uh, you know, in various ways. Uh, and so um, part of the data set concept is the ability to create uh, catalogs uh, and indexes on metadata associated with that uh, data. And, uh, and Kyle, I think, is going to give a demonstration of that. But then there's an interesting question, well, how does that relate to indexes that people might manage, already have for other purposes? And I think we're still trying to work through use cases for that. One option certainly is to uh, uh, be able to uh, mirror um, you know, in, in data that's in index, existing indexes into an index that we would maintain. Uh, you know, in other cases, though, in many cases, uh, there aren't existing indexes. And in fact, particularly, I think, in small, the small labs that we're targeting, you know, people have a lot of data in files. Maybe it's in some format like DICOM or HDFS uh, that has metadata inside it, but that metadata is not easily accessible. So we're going to be building tools that will extract metadata and, and use it to populate catalogs for people. Any other questions that I can answer rather than referring to Carl and Kyle. <laughs> I could answer it, but it would be a shame to give all their talk for them. So, Okay, so uh, maybe we'll uh, break at this point, unless uh, there's yes. something else you want to do? No, thank you, Ian. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, good. so we'll resume at...